Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles podcast. I'm Len Edgerly, and today is Thursday, March 31st, the last day in March. I, I'm just making my commitment to put an episode of the show up each month, and I am on Sanibel Island, Florida. We'll be heading back to Cambridge, I think, uh, May 1st or so, maybe the last day in April, uh, driving the Tesla back to Cambridge. This week, I want to bring you an interview with Kristen Illardi, who is Director of Satellite Media at Penguin Random House. And Kristen is someone that I've worked with for the last four years or so, and she does an excellent job of connecting me with authors, uh, Penguin Random House authors, who are doing book tours, and she arranges opportunities for people like me to interview authors. Generally, there's a day where an author is going to sit down with a number of different people, and I'll get a half an hour time slot, and uh, th they tend to be just fantastic authors, so it's it's really a, an opportunity for me. She will send a pitch for an author, and sometimes it's right up my alley, something that interests me. Other times I'll say I'll pass, uh, but it's it's been a, a good email relationship. And when I had, uh, let's see, I had an interview I was going to do with the Sanibel City Manager, and I thought I was going to do it in March, but it got kicked into April, so I, I, I didn't have someone to talk to for the March show, so I thought, well, what about Kristen? Why not just see if she would come on the show and talk to me about her work as a publicist at one of the big five publishers? And I was very happy that she said yes, I, she'd be honored to come, and we talked on Tuesday this week, uh, March 29th. Turns out she is in Colorado Springs. I've always pictured her being in New York, and she did spend some time in New York, and you'll hear about her background as we talk about it. <laughs> she said that normally, because she's dealing with interviews all the time, she has a, an external microphone that has pretty good quality, but her husband took the family microphone on a trip that he made to uh, uh, California, I think, and uh, so she was on her laptop microphone, I was able to tweak it in Logic Pro. I think it's uh, pretty easy to listen to, but uh, normally the, the next time I talk to her, I, I, I hope she has the family microphone with her. Over the years, it was fun to look back. Uh, the first author she put me in touch with was David Bell, who wrote a novel titled Somebody's Daughter. That was in June of 2018. And then Jasper Ford, who was from Wales. Uh, I talked to him about his book Early Riser in January 2019. Uh, a, a veteran author who I think is credited with creating the medical thriller, Robin Cook, who's from Boston, uh, had a book titled Genesis, and I talked to him in December of 2019. A debut novel uh, titled Memorial was released in October of 2020 by a really smart young author, uh, Brian Washington, and I enjoyed talking with him, and then talked to C.J. Box about Dark Sky and Paul Rudnick playing The Palace. Uh, uh, there are two authors coming up next month that you'll hear us talk about in the interview. One is Michelle Hun Hunivan, and her novel Search w is available for pre-order. It'll be released on April 26th. It's a really cool story about a Unitarian search committee, and I was raised a Unitarian, so I, I jumped on that one. And then a debut novel, Housebreaking, by Colleen Hubbard. Uh, that will be released uh, on April 19th. So I'm going to interview those two authors, uh, April 18th and April 19th, and then I'll also be interviewing the... So I've got three interviews scheduled for April, so I, 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 there'll probably be more than one episode of the podcast in April. Let's get right to the interview. I started out just asking Kristen how she got ended up working at Penguin Random House. She's been there for 17 years, and uh, you'll hear that it's a story of consistently working hard and adapting to changes in the industry. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation. So I graduated um, from Wake Forest in North Carolina um, with a business degree, communications degree, double major, um, and set about interviewing in the corporate world, hope to do something a little creative to, you know, you know, capitalize on my writing. Um, but it's figuring maybe a marketing corporate job would be, to be where I'd end up and did lots and lots of interviews and just just hated that corporate atmosphere for myself. I mean, I found myself just looking, where's the nearest bookstore nearby the office place and looking at that as a silver lining and realized that even though it just seemed like such a practical, you know, way to kind of start my career, it just wasn't for me. Um, so I took a leap of faith and found this uh, program through Columbia 
which is their publishing. Um, it's, it's a certificate, so it was just a several week long, full on intensive program covering every aspect of publishing through their journalism um, school. Uh, and luckily got in, it was um, pretty selective at the time, um, knew nothing but figured that this would give me my leg in, in the publishing world. Um, and you know, thank goodness that's how it ended up because initially I thought I'd like to be an editor. I'd like to, you know, read through splash piles and find the next book. And that program really what it got for me is just to understand that I, I did not want to be an editor. I liked using my business background and kind of working that in through corporate communications and publicity and things like that, a little bit of a faster pace. Um, and it just kind of helped me just those few weeks helped me find where kind of I wanted to be in that world. Um, and sure enough, that's how I ended up at Penguin in my first job. What was your first job at Penguin? So right out of that course, I got hired to be the assistant to assistant of the SVP of Com Corporate Communications and Publicity for Penguin. Um, so, you know, really started out on the ground level. <laughs> um, what kinds of things did they have you doing oh, in those my first goodness. few weeks? It, it was, you know, it was the publishing world's version of Devil's Wears Prada a little bit in terms of just the most insane things would happen behind the scene. My, my boss at the time worked with all the highest profile authors in the house and she did all the corporate communication strategies for you know uh, the CEO and such. So I was just thrown in at the ground level. I remember being in, in my first week and at the time no one really knew how to use PowerPoint, but I did. And it was, you know, I was suddenly creating slides for the board meeting for the CEO. So Within, you know, just as a matter of circumstance, I somehow just got thrown into these very high profile things. I mean, my boss at the time, she was such a, poor, a force in the publishing world and super demanding long hours. We'd be there for 12, 13 hours a day. Oh, my God. Doing, you know, every, <laughs> everything and anything. Um, but wow, what a great experience looking back to be kind of just brought in at that level, um, kind of seeing how things worked, even though I was just the assistant to the assistant, we learned so much, um, in such a short period of time. Um, so, you know, I made my way up to assistant and then yep. a few years later I was promoted to the assistant manager of corporate communications, um, which was a great place for me. You know, it was exactly where I wanted to be in terms of my business degree, um, and being able to do just the PR side all at once. Um, cause we were still working with the big authors and such on the publicity campaigns. Um, uh, and it was great. And it was actually out of that, I was tasked to do kind of a cost savings program for all of the different publicity activities that were going on across the house. Um, and it was there that I realized that, um, we had been at the time just outsourcing these satellite media tours to different PR companies, um, just kind of freelance smaller PR companies to do the work for us. Um, and I realized what is a satellite media tour, is that like a, a book tour that you think of an author doing or did it have to do with podcasts and things like that? At the time, a satellite media tour, were, were, they were super popular. And what it was is that we'd hire these companies to kind of book us. We'd set aside a morning and within, you know, a six hour window, they'd book our authors on, you know, 15 to 20 interviews back to back to back. Um, uh -huh. th through, across the country. Now they can be, and they might be TV stations, were, radios, just anybody that wanted to do an interview. We would have TV ones that were specifically TV, which were very popular at the time, and that required getting the author into a studio and mm -hmm. you know booking a satellite feed and beaming them down to each of these individual stations. Um, you know, all the big authors did that at the time. Huh. And then on the, we'd also do strictly radio tours, only morning drive on news talk, um, back to back phoners, 10 minutes a piece. Um, that was just what we did. <laughs> wow. And so at the time I realized that, you know, if we just brought that service in house, it would be cost savings, but also we'd have a little bit just more control over what each individual author actually wanted to do instead of meet like a specific quota of interviews. Um, and who knows huh. our authors best, but us as publicists, um, Huh. So, yeah, that was greenlit. And next thing you know. And when did that happen? When did you do, uh, have that bringing that in house? Um, planning stages in 2010. We launched January 2011. I see. Huh. <laughs> and uh, that's fascinating. So and and so it, in 2011, 
are the interviews still mainly radio, TV, traditional media that you're setting Absolutely. up? Absolutely. 2011, mm-hmm. straightforward. We did about 25% TV tours where, you know, getting those authors in studio. I had a studio I partnered with, and we, we did all that. And then 75% radio, strictly drive time, news talk, back-to-backs. Um, so, yes, we, we, we started off and set off to do everything just as we were hiring out to do. Um, and that's what worked at the time. That was, you know, perfect. That's what all the authors wanted. Um, it was great. It was great. Um, so that's how we started. And then, you know, a lot changes in a decade, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So how uh, how did the changes uh, start appearing? Do you remember the first time you heard a podcast and thought, oh, this is a whole new, another way to communicate with the authors, getting their word out? Absolutely. And I'll be honest, when we first saw, you know, po- people, you know, pl- asking if we can be inter- interview our authors for a podcast, we were like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and then there was, you know, no way to tell the reach, you know, who are these people speaking to? It was just uncharted waters that we would, you know, certainly avoid for a little bit um, until we started kind of understanding that this was like actually going to stick around, right? Podcasts have been around for, you know, decades, but who listened to them until a decade ago (laughs) at the start? Right. Um, So, you know, it was a gradual change that we would try them out here and there. And then, you know, the initial podcast network started coming about um, and, you know, before we knew it, we woke up one day and people were banging on our door saying, you know, authors only want podcasts and they're, ah. this is the new thing. This is the trend here and it's not going away. Um, so, yeah, we obviously just had to adapt to this. And, you know, we realized what a great opportunity it was because here you are like able to connect, you know, at the time radio is, is all white, all male. They want very specific topics that are just, you know, have wide mainstream appeal and that's that. But, you know, we have a book for everyone. And suddenly we had an audience for everyone with podcasts. So just the idea of this like niche targeting to find these loyal listenerships with these podcasts was just like, you know, it was like discovering a completely new world out there. Yeah. Just what an opportunity it was. And, you know, still that's, that's what we spend a lot of our time doing is just researching and finding new ways to, you know, meet these people where they are with these books that we have. So it's just been so great. I can imagine that uh, I used to be a, a huge fan of Sam Tannenhaus's uh, podcast, the the book review podcast at the Times. Yeah. Which did it start around then, two thousand ten? Or um, that's a good question. It just feels like it's been around forever. So probably somewhere around in that window. Yeah. Um, and did you were you able to to book authors on that podcast? As I would think, it would have been sort of the preeminent podcast possibility back you know, in those early the, days. Yeah, and at the time, probably not so much because it was also just a different way. Lead times and things like that um, would would you know factor into that where you know for the New York Times book report that you just were working on a different time schedule. Time yeah, and it would be a separate thing. It wouldn't be something that you do that plus five other interviews that day. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um so yes, working into you know so many of the longer format interviews don't necessarily want to be part of these junket schedules um back to back back. so you know it's that that's what we kind of work with each day sometimes it's an author will have six really good long form interviews rather than the full 15 interviews it really just depends on the book and the subject matter so i mean the biggest change that has happened over the course of the decade is that we tailor each tour to meet what the author's book's about, how the author, you know, their own personalities and preferences and such um, to give them what makes most sense for them. Um, and podcasting has really allowed us to do that. Well, now I'm, I'm getting ready for two author interviews coming up. Uh, Search, Michelle, how do you say her last name? Huneven with an H, yeah. And then the other one is... Um, Colleen Hubbard. Colleen Hubbard, right. So let, let's take... Uh, Michelle's book, she's kind of an established author, uh, been nominated for big prizes. It's a wonderful book. I'm really enjoying it as a former Unitarian, and it's about that. Uh, what would that look like? You you're, you know that book's coming out. It's probably going to be a pretty big book, uh, and you're talking about the satellite media tour for that book. Do you start with her, or do you make a plan, or what, are, what is sort of the shaping of 
that day when she's going to be talking to me and a bunch of other people look like? What? How, how do you put it together for a, a specific book? Um, so actually the author's brought in pretty late to what the schedule is. Um, I work directly with um, the author's publicist who, you know, is very uh-huh. familiar with, you know, personalities again and preferences of that author. And, you know, we kind of make a basic, they'll let me know, if they're super willing to do lots of interviews, if they're a little bit hesitant and all that stuff is really important to know. Cause obviously you need someone with lots of enthusiasm once you get on the air um, for someone like Michelle, who's a seasoned, you know, an author. Um, the, the, the real standout um, thing about her is that she's a James Beard award-winning author, which is you know, yep. a very cool aspect to just the same for a fiction book. Um, and so for her, we, we started out going after our, you know, we have a nice, good repertoire of book podcasts, book, uh, writing podcasts. Um, and mm-hmm. those are great. The conversations are just fantastic. So a lot of, um, you know, the authors themselves are doing the interviews and the conversations are just top notch. Um, so mm-hmm. we usually start off there with our fiction authors across the board. And then for huh. someone like Michelle, now we're actually getting into food writers as well, food right. writers and food podcasts. And so we got a lot of interest there for Michelle um, for obvious reasons. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, that's a perfect example of just how obviously it's just a one off that we'd be pitching a food distribution list. And here mm-hmm. we're doing that and getting a lot of interest. So she will have a combination of writing podcasts and food com- uh, food. Uh, writers and podcasts and then in addition then we also always are pitching npr um and Uh people who will do some uh, longer format piece um specifically about a fiction book now her book uh uh involves uh well that, it, now it's not published till april 26th right. can we say what it's about because yeah, there's a description of it in amazon sure. so Abroad, that, in broad yeah. terms yeah so it's about uh, a search for a minister in a unitarian church because of that, do you do you have a, a list of Unitarian podcasts or things that you can target specifically on that sort of spiritual seekers dimension? Uh, we do. We oh, we have a list for everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I haven't actually even gotten there yet because I've had so much interest in the first two um, pockets. But yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm doing another book currently about a, a set of Catholic nuns that went to start a book in India. Same thing. Yes, we're doing the religious sector and, and things. And that again is what is so great there's just an audience for everyone so yes you would be surprised there is a podcast i'm sure for people who just like bananas right there's some (laughs) i think that's right yeah yeah how do you keep track of all you know i i've interviewed seven authors that you connected with me and and i went back and i i listened to the the one with uh Let's see, who is that? David Bell. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I talked to him. I have this vague memory. Uh, And my memory is not as good as yours, I'm sure, just of the age difference. But do you have a spreadsheet? I mean, how can you possibly keep track of all of these moving pieces and and not have something hit the floor? (laughs) Um, I think just per scope, we do about 170 to 180 per year. Um, authors uh-huh. come through us and I mean honestly we keep a master calendar that's just mapped out and we focus on you know four months at a time usually seasonally publishing works with a yeah. seasonal schedule um, and that way we you know we really do spend a lot of time just sitting down mapping out what we don't want subject matter to you know cross paths with something that's too similar we don't want to plant fiber-based diets happening the same week type thing so that takes a I lot see. of thought out practice and we we will set that up months in advance as to what happened mm-hmm. when um and then you know from there obviously just all of our archives you know finished tour schedules you know we keep in our back pocket and we re- are referring to all the time just we have a lot of repeat authors and just you know com- comparison titles and such that we'll go back and you know look at what we booked previously and see how we yeah. tweak them and change them for the future well, let's pull back a little to the uh, the author interview. What makes a good author interview? What what have you seen? And I guess I'm thinking from the author's point of view. Mm-hmm. Like if if you've got an author and you're saying we're going to spend some time talking to these these people, and uh, you probably get some feedback from authors saying, "Well, boy, I, that was great. That wasn't." What's the what are the best things that can happen f- from an author's point of view in having the kind of interviews that get done? Number one best thing, pre- prepared hosts. Um, you know, huh. people who have read that book and the authors can tell immediately if <laughs> the author, at least, ha- I mean, if the host has at least dived in a little bit and, you know, started the book. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how many people will work. I mean, we provide 
all of, as you know, all of uh, the hosts that we're pitching just with some guidance, talking points and such, um, just to help steer the conversation a little. But, you know, there's certainly those people who just read off that sheet. And it's, you know, so obvious. An author is just so much more willing to open up to someone who's prepared, who's done a little homework on each person. You know, usually personal touches make all the difference, right, for everyone in life. So um, personal anecdotes and such, uh, authors are so much more willing to share when they know that the host is engaged with them right back. So you're saying that the author would be more likely to share a- a personal anecdote if they're feeling that they're talking to somebody who knows their work and understands them, whereas they might just be a little more uh, less self-revealing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. If someone is just reading off of a piece of paper yeah. um, and, you know, finding those common connections, just like in daily conversation, you know, what, what makes it better to talk to someone? I mean, the fact that you brought up that you were raised Unitarian and, you know, talking to Michelle, that will make that conversation infinitely better. Um, so right, right. these little things, and it really just comes down to the host's preparedness for the, for the interview. And we think a lot about that as we're booking each of the interviews and who we even pitch to as to who we uh-huh. know will do a good job with this because you know it's a waste of everyone's time if it's just you know what paper because i could read that right i don't need a conversation about it. yeah one thing i've done uh off and on is to ask the author to read an excerpt from his or her book what are the pros and cons of doing that i love an excerpt i think that the author loves an excerpt i think it sets the tone for i mean obviously not too long but it sets the tone for what the book's about it gives the listener a good feel for what they're getting into and it's a great um jumping off point to you know further conversation about that so i think that excerpts are great um with it reason in terms of time frame but you know three four paragraphs one to get some started a lot of shows are doing that and i think it's great One thing that I've uh, noticed uh, in my own conversations and then listening to, uh, I I guess this is to to take the uh, focus to the listener, like the people that listen to my conversations, what do they need and what makes a successful interview for them? Uh, And I think a mistake I've caught myself making sometimes is I read a book and I get so excited about it and I've got an MFA from Bennington in poetry. I'm sort of a literary guy and it's very hard for me to resist the temptation to to be the smartest kid in the English class that understands the book and, and all, all these themes and did you do that? And I, I think I've gotten some feedback from listeners that, yeah, that not so interesting. We'd rather just hear the author speak about their story. We're not so much interested in how well you understood the book, you know, (laughs) but, but I think sometimes an author, you can hear that an author appreciates that. Uh, I I try to remember who it was. There's somebody I heard interviewing somebody else and they had fallen into this, you know, the MFA trap and the author was kind of a, a naturalist author. She hadn't got an MFA. She was just writing really well, big bestseller. And this interviewer was saying, well, you know, when, when this character does that, that, that kind of is part of that theme that you laid out in chapter three. And it was like, the, the poor woman was like a deer in the headlight. She said, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're <laughs> trying to explain my book to me. And, uh, and I, I just, oh gosh, make a note to self. Do not ever do that. But, but what, what have you seen, heard and done on, on sort of the, uh, the role of the interviewer, especially if it's an interviewer who loves books and uh, there's some opportunities there, but also some pitfalls, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I think that's probably an extreme case of uh, totally dictating what actually that author was thinking at the time. But on the flip side, you know, when someone just kind of picks up on a certain underlying theme or, or tone of what they're doing. I've seen, I've, just, I've heard authors just light up at that and be like, yes, huh. you do understand you're getting it. So, I, I mean, it's, it's a dance, it's a fine line. And, you know, it's just something that a little bit of understanding and coming from that um, background expertise, that's why authors just love talking to other authors um, because, yeah. you know, they've been there, they understand and everyone has certainly a different process and way of getting to from point A to point B, but at the same point, they just understand each other so well. So definitely just the dance between the two, but I, I've heard it in their voices when they recognize that the person that they're speaking with just gets what they're what they're trying yeah. to do and it's just a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, it's exciting for the interviewer you 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 sort of forget that you're what you're doing because uh you, you get these lights going off and uh <laughs> the other thing i'll confess to you but be careful how you use it is uh i kind of live for an author 
or anybody else I interview for the podcast saying, that's a really good question, you know, and, and something in me just goes, you know, oh boy, I've asked a good question. And, uh, and I think most of the time it's, uh, I, I've had people who I felt were prepared by their publicist to every fourth question say, oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> and then it gets really awkward. But, uh, I think as an aspiration, I, I do want to ask good questions. I want to ask a question that maybe they haven't been asked mm -hmm. before or that follows up from something they said two minutes ago and I'm piecing it together and saying, now, how does that relate to what you said? Or, But maybe, maybe what's a good question? Uh, how, 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 how do you sort of aim in your preparation and just in the conversation to, to ask good questions of an author? I mean, it's that would just vary so much between each author. But I think that you're absolutely right that he, I, I hear it myself when I'm you know, listening in on these conversations that especially in the setup that we're doing, where you're doing multiple interviews on one day. I mean, they're being asked the same thing over and over again. So they get this one that's intelligent and, you know, intuitive and insightful and they're hearing it for the first time. And it's, you know, a natural reaction to be like, oh, good question here, because they're, you know, uh -huh. you know, excited for something new and to just speak about something new. So, so, yeah, there's such variance. But I mean, I can't tell you, we do, I would say have the majority of people, you know, start with what we've given in terms of just talking points. And that obviously that's, again, a launch pad for what, um, you know, you guys can get into next, but mm -hmm. hearing something that's just, you know, tell, tells that you've read their book and are thinking about the characters and or the plot line and such and asking it in a different way than what's been handed to you. Um, I've, I've heard it time and time again, authors just commenting. It's a good question because it's new, it's different, and it gives them something fresh to speak about. Yeah, I just think that freshness, if uh, because you can sort of hear it when an answer has been given before. It, it doesn't have the energy of something that's being thought out, as it said. Um, I suspect that you kind of scan ahead to, uh, I mean, are you going to be doing TikTok author interviews? Or what? what's next, like, podcast uh, arriving 10 years ago that you're going to want to make sure that you're connecting your authors with? I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have that crystal ball and see what was coming next? But um, for sure, we are, you know, publicity teams across the board and marketing as well are all up in social media and what's coming next. I mean, you know, a few years ago, no one had heard of TikTok. And here we are, you know, I think it's something like 35% of people have accounts now, right? So it's just crazy. And we're, we're jumping on that as best as possible and, you know, keeping tabs on that and, and trying new things in terms of, you know, TikTok videos for launches and such like that. And so, I mean, who knows what the next thing will be, but, you know, we, if we're smart, we'll stay on top of each one as they come. And, you know, you have, you let the old things go, you get into the new, you got to just be there, just be there and find these people. Bookstagrammers, what that's, that wasn't a thing. Now it, it is. Yeah. I mean, we're sent, we used to be sending mailings out to just, you know, celebrities and just different, you know, people of whatever stature. Now we're sending them out to influencers. Like it's just yeah. that's the world has just changed so much. And it's just you have to find those new avenues, how to reach people. And, you know, it's all about the social media right now. And yeah. it's not going away. Um, and in audio, too. I mean, I know you're very on top of it just with Clubhouse and meeting yeah. room and all these new social things for audio that are just, you know, popping up here and there and just gaining traction. So we're absolutely just trying to figure that out and, you know, getting authors involved in those things and just seeing what sticks and what works and what's moving. Hmm. Um, so absolutely such a change from traditional media, but such an opportunity because there's just so many ways to go about each book. And, you know, that's a great exciting thing for sure. Yeah, and I think the, the, the exciting thing about your work, too, is that when you do that and everything else you're doing, you're helping readers find authors that mm -hmm. otherwise they just wouldn't. And, and every time you connect someone with a book, it feels like you've, you know, an angel gets its wings mm -hmm. or something. It's pretty cool. For sure. I mean, absolutely. That's what I love most about my job is to be able to connect a good book with a new reader. And, you know, again, I think we, we talked about how to, you know, 
coach a, a new author, but just, you know, these authors that are so seasoned and been doing this for year after year, that's not, we have, we don't have to be involved with that at all. They know how to do an interview, but what we do need to do is find even, you know, newer audiences or unique ways of getting that book to new people rather than just keep setting them up with the same interviews over and over again. Um, so that connection is, you know, what it's all about when you work in publishing and everyone has such a passion for books that works in publishing. And it's just, you know, it's an amazing thing and being able to just, you know, keep shouting from the rooftops about a new author is just what everyone wants more, more than anything else. Right. That's the goal. You uh, probably do a lot of book reading, but when you go to go on vacation or you're uh, doing some strictly pleasure reading, have you got a book that, currently that uh, you're really enjoying or you'd like to mention? Well, I should say I cannot tell you the last time I read a book on vacation because I have four kids under eight years old. And okay. unless it's Cat in the Hat, I'm not sure, or Harry Potter ah. with the older ones. Um, you know, mm-hmm. but that in itself, I will say, has been just such a joy because it's looking back to what I read as a child and yeah. getting that to the audiences, and there's just so much out there on the young reader's side. But for me, um, I, I just picked up The Love of My Life by Rosie Walsh. Um, it's actually mm-hmm. Good Morning America's book club pick for this month. Um, and I just got it in the mail. I worked with Rosie a few weeks ago, and she's just wonderful. Oh. Um, and loving it so far. I mean, I just literally am a couple pages in, but that's on my hit list. So maybe I'll you know, get an hour here or there to, to dive really into it without a knock at my door by a child. That's right. That's right. Let me just finish this paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's great. Well, I, and I want to thank you for all the, the authors that you've connected with uh, me with over there. I'm, I'm sort of shifting to a, a, a monthly schedule, but I, I, I love doing these. So you're, you're one of my main channels of uh, great people to talk to, and I look forward to have, keeping that going in the future. That is great. I mean, we feel the same way about you. I mean, we love having our authors on the air, and you interview such different people, and I like how it's just different aspects of, of your own life and, and different, you know, the business side, everything about it on the, on the Kindle front. So we always love to do interviews with you. We know you prepare and read the book and ask those great questions that we're hoping for for interviews. Uh, <laughs> we got to keep working together. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I have been speaking with Kristen Ilardi, director of Satellite Media at Penguin Random House. Thanks very much, Kristen. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, I really enjoyed that conversation with Kristen. As we were getting started, uh, I said, I, I feel like I'm having a chance to see the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain because I'm dealing with somebody that I've, you know, I, I've gotten such a uh, a lot of help from over the past four years, uh, but I, you know, I've never seen her in person on Zoom or anything, and all of a sudden I get a chance to see her uh, at her home in Colorado Springs, and she said she felt the same way, you know, she pitches things to this guy and he has a podcast, and, and so we had a chance to to see who, who, who was behind the various screens of uh, the Penguin Random House publicity department and the, and the Kindle Chronicles. Uh, I, I love just having a sense of the arc of her career. I, I, you know, I think it's admirable and uh, perhaps a little unusual for someone to take a job out of college, essentially, except for that Columbia course she took, and then take a job and start out as assistant to the assistant of the senior vice president for communications and and then just keep working and improving and i'm sure she's upped her game over that period of time and now she's looking ahead to you know what are the next ways to connect uh, authors with readers and offline we did some talking about the alexa flash uh platform which of course i've been experimenting with for the last two years and I tried to pitch it to Mayor Pete and saying, boy, that'd be a great way to stay in touch with people. And and she said, she's going to look at it. I can tell from uh, just the, the comments when I brought it up that she'd like to learn more. And maybe certain, I can imagine an author who is maybe kind of techno savvy or just interested in the chance to put something up. Wouldn't have to be every day like I do, but uh, have something where uh, fans or readers could uh, summon uh, their echo show and hear some kind of a five minute uh, uh, greeting or something to think about from an author so anyway that's that's going to be a lot of fun and and also the Sanibel city manager has indicated interest so after my my long years of uh, evangelizing in the wilderness it would be fun if I could actually uh, get some folks interested in this platform and I've reached out to the Amazon team so I've got somebody queued up on their blueprints flash briefing 
team that will be glad to help out uh, if if uh, Kristen or uh, Dana Souza end up wanting to learn more about it. Uh, the the part of it too was fun is uh, to imagine what it was like back in 2011 or so when podcasters were saying we'd like to have your author on our show and Kristen and other people there say well you know what what is this is this how do we do the numbers and how do we learn about it and then it gradually just takes hold and then the next thing you know authors are saying boy we'd really like to be on this podcast uh because I'm so interested in how technology gets adopted in social media, it's it's really uh, exciting for me to hear a story of somebody who has actually experienced how a technology has arrived and how it has changed an industry like the uh, book publicity industry. Uh, of course, it was fun for me to, to uh, talk shop with her about uh, good interviews. It largely confirmed my sense that preparation is I love doing I love preparing for uh, one of these things I read the book I highlight it my Kindle I print out all my notes and then I uh, diagram my you know I, I spent a lot of time uh, for the joy of it and so it was fun for her to confirm that from an author's point of view they can pretty well tell when someone has put any preparation into it other than just asking the the kind of canned questions that Kristen and other publicists helpfully uh, you know send their way uh so that was nice and and then i think just the uh, sense that it's a dance you know you 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 want to ask questions that are thought provoking original but you don't want to i i at least don't want to become uh, too much of the conversation. I like to get things going and then step back. And I, I think what, what she was confirming was she listens to a lot of these interviews and she can tell when an author has been sort of uh, gone to a different energy level because the interviewer has shown some preparation or has shared something personal and and it's it's like a flower opening up is how I picture it and I've experienced it too that, that in a good conversation or in a good interview uh, there are those moments when things just become more real and I, I like to think they become uh, more intriguing to listen to when, when those kinds of things are happening. Uh, we've had a great time in Sanibel. Darlene's sister Deb leaves tomorrow for Omaha. She's been with us since December here in the new house. And Darlene and I will be driving back, as I said, probably leaving uh, April 30th. And it has just been a wonderful time. You know, we, we had some medical trouble at the start when Darlene was in the hospital a couple of times for mysterious fever. And she's fine. Everything's great. Uh, but speaking for myself... I think that this time here has, it's been part of my stepping back from doing the weekly show and and the time that has opened up because I'm moving to a monthly show. I'm reading more books, I'm meditating, I'm, I'm doing things that I didn't think I had time for when I was working so hard on the weekly podcast and some other responsibilities that I've, I've stepped away from. I've, 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 I've stepped away from being responsible for consuming, you know, three hours of news every day. I don't read any news from the daily newspapers. Uh, although recently I've gone back to the New York times and the Washington post because of the war in Ukraine, but generally I'm reading weekly magazines and, uh, so and and I just attribute a lot of these changes, which I hope are part of aging gracefully. As you know, I'm in my seventy second year now. Uh, it's it's very easy to make these kinds of changes in such a beautiful place that has such a uh, commitment to nature. Two thirds of the island is nature preserve, and uh, it's it's just it is. It's like a paradise, and I feel incredibly grateful for it. And I'm glad I still have fun people to talk to, uh, like Kristen Alardi and some of the people that are coming up in April. And uh, I hope you're in, enjoying the, the show in its uh, monthly format. Uh, uh, and it may be more often, as I said. We'll probably have more interviews in April. Thanks very much for listening. Hope you have a great day. Bye. <laughs>